Welcome to Opalash TV. Today I'm in Zurich together with Joe Tausig. Joe is the founder of Tausig Capital. This is actually the fourth video we're doing together on insurance and reinsurance related themes. We're now looking today at captive insurance and what that means for asset managers. But before we start, Joe, why don't you explain what's captive insurance? A captive insurance is a form of self-insurance. Let me give you two examples of self-insurance. A company like IBM over the years has spent billions of dollars on insurance, and they would look at the premiums that they paid to big companies like Zurich, AIG, Chubb, and then they would look what their losses were, and there was a big difference. And they said, gee, you know, why should we buy insurance? We can just pay for each loss out of petty cash. So that's an example of someone deciding to self-insure. The other example is most people have car insurance, homeowner's insurance, uh, health insurance. They have deductibles. Well, the deductible is a form of self-insurance. You're insuring the lower levels of risk, if you would. If you wanted the insurance company to cover the first dollar, they would charge you more than that $100 deductible you might have because they know you're going to use $100 of health insurance each year. And uh, so it, it removes some of the frictional costs of insurance. Captive insurers exist because, for example, when IBM was looking at their, their insurance uh, requirements and their costs, uh, some of them were auto liability and workers' compensation, which are mandatory in America. And so IBM really can't self-insure directly. They have to do it indirectly. So they go to an insurance company who issues the policy on a precondition the insurance company will reinsure to IBM's captive. So IBM is really bearing the bulk of the risk, if you would, as it should in self-funding. But IBM, IBM could afford to buy an insurance company, but decided didn't really want to buy one and operate one. So this is a facility that's done by people like AIG or Zurich or Chubb to get the other business, you know, the big plant and equipment and things that IBM doesn't want to take uh, the full economic responsibility for the risk. Another reason captives exist is a concept called risk funding. So the best example of that is something like Exxon. Exxon knows that it's going to lose a platform out in the sea or Exxon Valdez type problem once every 10, 20 years. And what an Exxon would like to do is say, okay, it's going to cost us a billion dollars every 10 years. We'll set aside a hundred million and we'll deduct it from our taxes or in income tax returns and we'll invest it over time. And if the event happens after 10 years, we've, we've lost $100 million a year instead of $1 billion, boom, one time. But the, the accounting and tax system does not allow them to do that. But if they owned an insurance company and they wrote that $100 million check each year, and that insurance company set aside the money for the reserves to pay it, then they, that's all legal. So Exxon says, well, why should I do that to AIG and Chubb? Because they'll be a lot more costly. We'll do it with ourselves. And so the, the origin of captives were basically to address a lot of regulatory accounting and tax issues, if you would, in self-insuring, if you would. These kind of started out with large S&P 100 type companies doing this and what we call single owner captives. And then they eventually came to what they called group captives. So a good example back to Exxon. Exxon said, well, you know, everybody in our business has the same problem. So 50 oil companies got together in Bermuda and set up a company called OIL Insurance. And I may have the wrong numbers now, but at one time it had $5 billion in it. So it wasn't just Exxon, it was BP, it was Total, uh, you know, every big oil company you can think of because they all know they have the same kind of risks and they, they, they basically fund them through this specialized mutual insurance company, if you would. 
Uh, that has evolved into something else called risk retention groups in America. Uh, America insurance is regulation is fragmented at the state level. So a big insurance company that everybody would know doesn't really have a product. It has 50 slightly different variations of product. You have to often get uh, policy language and pricing approved in every state. To get around that, the, there was a risk retention act was passed. So if a group, an, affi an affinity group, got together and got licensed in one state, it was able to write business in all states, if you would. So it, it, it made it much easier where, I'll come to an example of ACE insurance in a bit. When ACE started, AIG tried to get the same rights in every state. It took almost more 10 years. So this is a, a much easier way to, to go. And this has also evolved in the form of captive call cell companies. So instead of having to pay all the expenses, separate auditors, accountants, have boards of directors, etc., you can still get the same economic benefit by buying a protected cell within a cell company, very much like the fund business business does too, protected cell companies in the fund business. So Joe, how have captives evolved over time? Well, in the beginning, they were primarily involved with the mandatory coverages, things like workers' compensation and auto liability. And then once they had them, they started looking at the cost of insuring other risks. So everything from general liability, product liability, E&O, D&O, excuse me, errors and emissions, directors and officers, uh, warranties, and eventually deductibles, things like healthcare deductibles which in group healthcare can be significant. Um, the, they then started covering risks they couldn't find any kind of coverage for. And I'll give you two examples. In the mid 80s, there was a crisis in, in uh, liability insurance. And ACE insurance was started by 35 companies, big fortune 100 companies that uh, needed some kind of liability insurance as a group captive. Um, ACE grew over time. We were involved in an initial public offering. It was only $585 million in 1992. And it continued to grow. And last year it bought Trump, uh, excuse me, it bought Chubb, that was Freudian. It bought Chubb Insurance. It's renamed itself Chubb and it's the largest property and casualty insurer in the world. Uh, but it all got started because there was no coverage available in the commercial market, so they started their own insurance company with a bunch of like-minded large companies, which included everything from J.P. Morgan and, and Merck and IBM, just some of the names that were in it of the 35 that started the company. 9-11 caused a, a crisis in medical malpractice, and people say, what do you mean, a medical malpractice crisis of 9-11? In 2001, the St. Paul companies wrote 35% of all insurance in the United States. And in 2002, they wrote zero. One third of all doctors had no coverage from their carrier at any price. And, uh, and you can't practice in most hospitals and clinics as a doctor unless you have $2 million of malpractice insurance. So why, why did this crisis happen? Well, the St. Paul companies reallocated the capital that they had tied up in malpractice insurance to marine and aviation, which went through the roof post 9-11. And so they were no longer writing the business. And so the only solution was for doctors to band together and form captives, if you would, to self-insure for each other. So it's a good example when no coverage exists, that why a captive makes sense. And we're going to get to that a little bit later in the discussion. So Joe, please give us an idea. How big is the captive insurance market? Yeah, estimates vary. First of all, there's a little bit of difficulty in how the count, the, the score is kept. So for example, uh, protected cell companies, uh, some people say that's one company even if it has more than 100 cells. 
we look at each cell as really a company, a, a captive insurer. It has discrete risks and, and funding and benefits and, and costs, if you would. Uh, can even file a separate tax return. The Some jurisdictions don't report. So for example, we don't know why, but the Seychelles has 1,500, 2,000 what we call micro captives owned by US car dealers, but you never see them in any tally. We happen to know that exists. And it's because it requires only 5,000 statutory capital to have an insurance company there. So it's the cheap and cheerful alternative for people. Uh, we think there are between eight and 10,000 uh, captive insurance companies. We think 85 to 90% of the S&P 500 have them. Uh, these things started out with big companies and they migrated to small, medium-sized enterprises are starting to use them quite, quite handily. There are at least 100 domiciles. Now, most of those are U.S. states today. In the beginning, U.S. states didn't uh, have legislation that was tailored to captive insurance. So essentially, the minimum capital you had to have and all the hoops you had to go through to be licensed uh, were way above the threshold, so it thrived in places like Bermuda and Cayman and Guernsey uh, very early because they had insurance legislation tailored to the fact that you're only insuring your own risk. You're not putting the public at large at risk of your, your financial stability, etc. Uh, the state of Vermont said this is, looks like a great opportunity. and. The state of Vermont today is the second largest captive domicile by, in terms of numbers, but it's the largest in the world in terms of premiums. And it made it a lot easier for US-based companies to set up and operate, if you would, within the continental United States. Um, my understanding is it generates $4 billion of income a year for the state of Vermont, a, a small state with less than a million population. It's a fairly significant a financial contributor to the state government. We think there's about 150 billion of annual premiums that come out of the business, and we think it's 500 billion of assets, investable assets, that are in the industry today. So why should asset managers care about captive insurance? The easiest answer, the, the easiest uh, response is there's 500 billion of AUM out there, virtually none of it allocated to hedge fund managers or alternative asset managers. Uh, they should be prospective clients, but to gain that business, you have to understand some of the mindset of the people that make the decisions. So there's someone called a risk manager at some level, if you would, and that risk manager is paid to, to save insurance costs. His or her job is, I want to reduce our cost of insurance. Consequently, they tend to be very, very conservative. The profit and loss statement in insurance is somewhat subjective. You're making assumptions of how likely a, a loss is to take place and the magnitude of the loss. And the more variables you have, the range of outcomes can be tremendous. And unfortunately, there's a built-in moral hazard in the business. In a commercial company, if you, your bonus is determined each year on a best guess and the stock options and stock price and everything like that, it's, uh, as long as you're growing, uh, you could arguably cook the books for 20 years for anybody to ever figure out you were, okay? Captives tend to be the opposite. The risk manager at IBM's worst nightmare is that he's under-reserved and he has to go back and ask mother for money. Uh, he'd probably lose his job and there's no other job and he's, he's not going to be the CFO, he's not going to be the head of sales, he's not going to be the head of product development. He can only work for a bigger company with a bigger risk profile. So they tend to be very, very, very conservative. Consequently, he doesn't want to lose money investing. He would much rather, we think about one third of that 250 billion sits in bank deposits. 
And, and granted, some of them have to be secured by letters of credit when you write business like workers' comp or auto, and you have to reinsure. But there are ways to, to do that. And I would think if a hedge fund manager wanted to look at this, particularly credit funds, and they have more than enough business where they don't really need you know, lights, electricity, et cetera, they would create an insurance only fund that's got a lot of ramifications, but one of the things they would do is waive the management fee and put a performance fee over a hurdle, kind of like Buffett did years ago, make it much more attractive to them and, and a risk sharing, and they might be able to pick up uh, tens of billions of dollars in this business. The second reason is there have been about 50 hedge fund managers that have started, that have started reinsurance companies. And this is a very good piece of business. And the reason uh, captives reinsure is because they're formed to save insurance costs, but they also tie up capital. So if you can make a proposition to them where they can save their insurance costs, but don't tie up the capital, where they can redeploy them into the business and to, uh, redeploy the equity and the letter of credit, lines of credit are tied up with letters of credit in the business. Uh, we've been doing that at Multistrat for years, but a lot of the other big players do it also. You know, the green light reads, the third point reads, because the the captive doesn't isn't so concerned about investing assets where the green light reads and the third point reads are. But the most important reason to go think about captives is to just have a captive insurance company for the asset manager. It, it, the, if you would, the economics of it, if you do it correctly, are you get a deduction for all the premiums, you get to invest those premiums, and, and if you have underwriting profits, and which most captives do, they have a 30 to 40 percent underwriting profit margin, if you would, compared to the commercial insurance world, and so you can make the payment equal to the commercial insurance world, and the investments compound, if you do it right, there's no income tax annually on all that compounding. So the amount of capital you put into the company, plus the float as Buffett calls, calls it. If you didn't do that, you would pay half of that in taxes in most places, and would, you would reinvest it uh, post-tax, and you'd have a certain amount of money down the road. Whereas if you do it through a, a captive insurance company, you get to take your pre-tax money and you get to invest it pre-tax and you get to harvest it on a capital gains basis down the road. So Joe, that's fascinating. Uh, I didn't know that industry was so big. Can you, can you tell us more about the recent trends and developments in that industry? Yeah, the, the, the biggest trend in the last five years is something called 831B micro-captives. And these have been targeted small, medium-sized enterprises. And essentially, there's a quirk in the U.S. tax law that if a insurance company has less than 1.2 million of premiums, and that number has been raised to 2.2 million for starting in 2017, there are no income taxes on its underwriting profits. There are income taxes on this investment profits, but a company, a small, medium-sized company could write a check for a million two to its captive. It's a little more complicated than that, but sort of filtering through the complications and take a million two deduction. So if you're a small company that earns, you know, a million to two million a year, that, that million two reduces your tax bill dramatically. And if you have minimal or no losses in the insurance company, then there's no income tax on the insurance company. And essentially, this is a way to, to take pre-tax dollars, if you would, and convert them into assets or risk converting risks into assets. The IRS hates this business. And by the way, we think there's four to 6,000 of these. And the IRS uh, started challenging some of them, and there are some abuses. There, there are rumors that there was someone bought tsunami insurance in Denver, Colorado, okay, and the IRS disallowed the deduction, as they well should. 
But a lot of these have what we call realistic but remote risks, and they can't necessarily get insurance for them. We'll discuss one of those in a second. Um, another change thing is Obamacare has really changed the whole healthcare industry in America. And a lot of companies are now self-insuring a lot of their Obamacare, if you would. It's driven people to self-insure. And again, it's back to self-insuring writing checks as you go along or self-insuring where you get a deduction and uh, you may or may not have to pay taxes on all the profits of the insurance company down the road. We'll, we'll get into discussing that in a second. The third trend is big is becoming cyber. Uh, I'm going to talk about cyber in some depth in a, in a minute, but we can give you four examples of disastrous cyber uh, examples, if you would, and it's virtually impossible to find that coverage anywhere. This is going back to the example of ACE in the mid 80s of no coverage and generating ultimately in 30 years the biggest property casualty insurer in the world. It's, uh, it's the 9-11 scenario, if you would. And, and cyber is becoming a big and big, bigger and bigger issue. We were at a conference recently and they asked how many of us had been hacked. And I had been hacked, my email was hacked, and at least half the room raised their hands. And I was telling that anecdotally to one of my colleagues, he said, well, the other half, half have been hacked, but they just don't know they have. Now, I don't think I was damaged very much by the hack, okay? But I'll give you examples of people who could be damaged substantially, particularly in the asset management business. And, uh, and that's an area for people to think about, because essentially, they have no insurance. They are already self-insuring. They just don't think of it that way. Now, I wonder. Right now, do many asset managers have captive insurers? No, they don't. And, and what happened in captive insurance, it was generally very big companies, you know, started out with the Fortune 500 and started moving down to small, medium-sized companies. But companies that are larger, particularly in staff uh, component than a lot of asset management companies are. But when the 831B, the micro-captive started where people could put money aside, take a tax deduction and have it build up uh, on a pre-tax basis, a number of small, a uh, number of asset managers that we found by accident have what they call 831B micro captives, and uh, one of them told us uh, when we when we met with them this year that he was signing the papers at New Year's Eve last year at a New Year's Eve party, and his comment was he wished he could have done more. But remember, there's a million two limit on premium, so there's a, there's a sort of mechanic uh, that that puts a uh, a bar on it. And for large asset managers or large hedge fund managers, this doesn't move the needle, if you would. Uh, we have a solution for them, and we'll discuss in a second. We think that, the, that as more and more asset managers weigh the benefits of having a captive, many, many more will come into the, into the captive space. Now, one reason that a number of uh, asset managers are joining is the cyber risk. I want to give you four examples of financial institutions that have had cyber risk problems. And my guess is none of them had any insurance. They were already self-insuring. When you have no insurance, you are self-insuring. You may not think of it that way, but you're self-insuring. Okay, so the first one is Knight Capital. Knight Capital is one of the biggest market makers in equities in the United States. And it appears they had some kind of software glitch. So this is an errors and omissions coverage, if you would and they lost $450 million in one day and went out of business, were sold a month later, okay? That's an insurable risk that you, you can't buy insurance for in the commercial markets, but you can start setting aside most of your, most of your uh, net income for that rainy day, okay? And we'll talk about what happens if the rainy day never happens, okay? Another example is HSBC. I'm very close to a very senior executive at HSBC who estimates that the rogue employee who stole the computer records in Geneva 
has cost HSBC $2 billion net already because customers left because they were not sure of the sanctity of their information. In other words, it was a very public uh, type of uh, uh, humiliation. The next piece is anecdotal. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. There was a, a major player in the business called the Clinton Group, you know, at least 10 years ago. And my understanding, they had a disgruntled employee who said that they were cooking the books. And the, my understanding is the SEC investigated and totally exonerated them. But meanwhile, $9 billion of the $10 billion of AUM went out the door and it never came back. And this is a huge, huge, if you present value the opportunity loss there, that's a huge and it's an insurable risk. Last one is, is the Bangladesh Central Bank was looted for $80 million before they, they caught it. So if you think about how asset management firms are so dependent upon their computers in so many different ways and all the bad things that could happen and, the, and, and in some cases are existential. Um, we, uh, we talked to somebody in the last week that we know quite well who all the, all, the compute, all the trading is done by algorithms. It's a CTA. And I would argue they could have a problem. You could present value the next 10 years worth of net income and that's what's at risk if, if they have a cyber problem and they're self-insuring it today. And in my opinion, they could probably take 50 to 100% of their net income every year and set it aside for that, that rainy day. If the rainy day happens 10 years down the road, the pile that they have to either survive or to get on with their lives is a lot bigger than if that, that, that income was taxed all along. And the rainy day never happens, it'll be a bigger pile to repatriate at capital gains rates, if you would. And for me, the, this is a no-brainer for this company. And so the more dependent someone is on, on the probity of their employees, uh, the computers that they use to generate their alpha, et cetera, the deeper they're self-insuring already and uh, they can benefit substantially by doing it the proper way. So Joe, you, you, you forgot to mention phishing. We just had the case that a hedge fund sued their fund administration company because apparently the administrator got a standard phishing email where the hackers, apparently Chinese, were asking them to finish off the week and kindly wire six million dollars, which according to the lawsuit that the fund has put against the fund administrator, the fund administrator's employees did immediately within minutes after having received that standard phishing email. So this case is still going on, but it shows the, the threat that both administrators and particularly asset managers, CTAs, anybody who has money with an administrator is facing all the time. So Joe, I understand that you have set up a platform solution for asset managers to set up captive insurers. So tell us more about it. How does it work and what are the benefits? Yeah, the company is called Affiliated Re, and we're setting it up in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is offshore for tax, but it's onshore for regulatory immigration and investments. The tax is, means that if you set it up correctly, uh, there's no income tax on underwriting profits and investment returns on an annual basis. They're deferred, and then they come out as capital gains afterwards. You could do that in Bermuda or Cayman, a bunch of other jurisdictions. But the problem is, is it, 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 that Puerto Rico is part of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, NAIC, and that gives you certain benefits in terms of doing business when the policyholders are physically in the United States, if you would. In addition, it eliminates the need for letters of credit for lots of types of business which is very difficult for certain types of hedge fund strategies to back letters of credit with their fund shares, for example. You, it's almost impossible fund shares. 
This allows the, the captives, the asset manager captives to invest directly in their offshore funds, if you would. Immigration sounds like a non-start, non-issue, but Bermuda is, had terrible work permit problems uh, going back about 15 years, and they only started addressing about five years ago, and it, it decimated their economy and sent 40% of their insurance professionals packing to other jurisdictions, ultimately. Major companies like Ace, uh, Decamp for uh, Switzerland is their headquarters. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty uh, brutal problem. Any U.S. citizen can work in Puerto Rico without a work permit. So you can, there's plenty of talent in America. If, uh, if you need insurance talent, you don't have to worry about getting a, a work permit. And even, even non-U.S. citizens can work in Puerto Rico more readily because of the state of the economy than if they try to get a work permit in a state like New York or California. And lastly, investments. Uh, dividends are, are qualifying dividends out of Puerto Rico. The profits of this type of business, if it were in Cayman or Bermuda, would be taxed at ordinary rates. This way they're taxed at uh, capital gains rates. The idea is, is that we're still very passionate about helping hedge fund managers come into the reinsurance business, uh, companies along the lines of Greenlight Re, Third Point Re. Uh, we created Multistrat as kind of, we used to say it was training wheels for asset managers, made it easier, a uh, much lower threshold of capital, uh, easier way to learn the business. But there's always, always that visceral uncertainty about uh, who are those guys out there? Are you going to do Sandy risk, etc.? Uh, when you're a captive, the, the policyholder controls the claims process. So they have much more comfort that they have control over the, the insurance side of this thing. They're already taking the investment risk. And we think that this is a better way for a lot of people. Not only is it valuable up front, but if they ever want to migrate to the Buffett model, uh, you just look at Ace. Ace started out as a captive and migrated to being the largest property and casualty insurer in the world in 30 years. And so it's a way for an asset manager to do well by uh, his or herself, but it's also a way to learn the business and it's an easier way to leg into something like Multistrat or ultimately leg into your own standalone company that's publicly traded.